Okay, welcome to another video. Today we're going to check out Bunsen Labs, the lithium version, which got a stable release as of yesterday. So we're quite quick on the marks today. I have already run the live system, however, it told me to reboot and then go into this screen to start the installer from here. You do also have an option here to install the image, uh, to load the image from RAM, which is pretty cool. So we're going to start the installer. And of course, it's based on Debian 10 and it uses Openbox, the uh, floating Windows manager. We will go through the release notes to see what's new as well. I'm not too well versed on Bunsen Labs, so it could be quite an interesting little run through. Okay, English, United Kingdom, and British English. Okay, so it's detecting and mounting CD-ROM. This can sometimes take a little while, so we'll pause the video here and then we'll come back to it once it has finished. Okay, so we're now configuring our host name. I'm just gonna call this one Tyler PC. And I'm not going to worry about a domain name, so we're just going to skip that part. Right, configuring network and user account. So we're going to go for Tyler, Tyler, user password. It didn't ask us for a root password. All right, continue. Right, it's detecting the disks. This could also take a little while just due to the amount of disks I have on this computer with various different operating systems all installed onto their own disk. Okay, no, not too long. So it's starting up the partitioner now. Okay, we're going to go for guided use entire disk. And we're going to use this SanDisk disk here on SDA. And we're going to do a separate home partition. I do like the Debian installer. Okay, let's see how that's actually set this disk up. So here's SDA. We have that's quite a large EFI partition of 536. We have a 30 gig for our root. And then we have a 34.3 gig swap, so that should enable hibernation. We'll test that out towards the end of the video. And then we also have 63.2 GB, the remaining space, all on home. Right, changes to disk, yes. Right, so it's partitioning the disks now, and then it's going to go into the section where it installs the system. So I'm going to pause the video here, but I'm going to make a note of the time. It's 1 o'clock exactly, so we can see how long this took to install. Okay, so it's telling us the installation has now complete, so that took... Three minutes, so it's three minutes past one. Okay, so it's removing live packages. So we'll add an extra minute on this because this won't take long. I'm going to pause the video now. And then once we reboot, we'll be in our freshly installed system. I will have to very quickly do a screen mirror. I don't know if there's a GUI on Bunsen Labs to enable that. We'll have a look at that and make sure that we've got a nice screen mirror so we can both see what's going on. Okay, so here we are, our freshly installed Bunsen Labs desktop, which of course uses Openbox as its Windows manager. They did have a GUI screen layout editor, which was AR&R, which saved me having to jump into a terminal and set the output to mirror using XR&R. So we can close that off now. We appear to have a little welcome screen script here. So we're going to run through this. I'm also going to move my camera because I appear to be blocking off quite a large portion of the conky display there. So let's move me to here. Okay, feels weird being at the top left. Right, so hi Tyler, welcome to Bunsen Labs Linux. This is an optional post installation script designed to help you configure your new installation. If you do not want to run this script now, you can run it at a later date by entering the command bl welcome in your terminal. So we'll continue with it now. So we're going to hit enter, type in our password, checking our internet. Okay, we passed that test. Right, so we've got a warning. Warning. <laughs> While FOSS is primarily about freedom and choice, certain choices are known to carry an increased risk of breaking things in Bunsen Labs. Two of the riskier things are adding Ubuntu PPAs to your sources list or installing a package that wants a newer version of libc. Um, a couple of the other riskier things can be found at Don't Break Debian. <laughs> Okay, we're going to type in I understand to continue to the next step. Okay, so it's now going to run an update and upgrade command. I'm not too sure how much this is going to con collect, so we might pause the video in case it takes too long. We'll have a quick look now. Right, so the following new packages will be installed. So that's going to install AppArmor, a new Linux image of 4.19.0-10. And it's also going to upgrade quite a few packages here like Transmission, Firefox ESR, Intel Microcode. So what I'm going to do is press Y 
and that's going to install additional onto disk 271 megabytes so it might take a couple of minutes so i'm going to pause the video here and then once that's finished we'll continue with the rest of the steps okay so it's just saying finish upgrade now so we're on to the next step you have the PAE enabled kernel installed and we're now on to Debian backports. Would you like to enable the Debian pack backport repositories in your sources list? We shall. So we're going to press Y to enable that. Press any key to continue. Also, obviously, you can install new packages from the Buster backports using install dash T. Buster backports and in the name of the package. So we're going to press any key. Okay, we have another backports repository, this time from Bunsen Labs. We shall also add that. And of course you can install again from here dash t slash dash t buster backports and then the package name once more. Okay. Would you like to install Bluetooth support? So I actually don't have Bluetooth enabled on this computer, so we don't need to enable any Bluetooth support whatsoever. So we're going to press N for no. Do I want Java? Uh, I don't really need it right now, so we're also going to press no for Java support. And we're also going to not bother with Flash Browser plugging either. I do like this welcome screen though, and it has a lot of sort of steps for you to get up and running with a few sort of commonly used things. It's quite cool. Dropbox. So I don't use Dropbox, but again, that's very useful for the people that do. So we're going to press no. Install development packages. The remaining screens offer you a chance to install less commonly used packages for developing software. We won't be needing that either. So I do believe that will be the last step. There we go. So we are finished. Thank you for selecting Bunsen Labs. Okay, so before we have a little look around, we're going to quickly jump onto their website and just get their release notes up just so we know what is new in this release of Lithium. So if we go onto Internet, Firefox ESR is our default web browser. We'll go through the applications as well so we know what we've actually got installed. Let's go on to the Bunsen Labs website. And there we go, Bunsen Lab Linux, and we're going to go to News, Stable Release. Here we go. Right, so major features of Bunsen Lab's Lithium include a new dark theme which features custom coloured papyrus icons. Nice, I quite like the papyrus icon pack. More modularity and flexibility, e.g. the BL session can coexist with the default open box or XFCE sessions. Okay, we might also install XFCE towards the end and see how that all works together as well. Openbox can be replaced with another Windows Manager, but keep BL's auto-started apps menu and keybinds. That's pretty handy. Bunsen Lab Sessions now uses JG Menu by default with many new features. We have a new init agnostic simplified BL exit script. Many improvements to Blob Themes Manager and Conkey and Tint2 Managers. So here's your Conkey here. And of course the Tint2 panel is down the bottom. Improvements to our first boot welcome setup script newly streamlined and now offering Bluetooth support. I must say that was actually a very easy process that whole welcome script. I enjoyed it quite a lot. Some default applications have been changed and new ones are added. Install and now support secure boot. Okay. And many other small tweaks, improvements and bug fixes. I'll leave a link to the entire release notes in the description of this video if you want to have a look at that and try it out. So let's get out of this then and see what's what. So we're going to start with the Conkey widget here. So it has the host, uptime, RAM, swap, disk and CPU usage. And we have some shortcut keys here to let you know how to open things up with the shortcut keys if you aren't quite used to it. So we have run dialog. So that's Alt F2. Let's see what that does for us. OK, cool. So we can then launch a program from here. Let's give that a test. There you go. So that's now opened up Funar for us, which is pretty handy. And of course, FUNA is the files manager from XFCE, and we have got version 1.8.4. We have the Alt menu. Let's see what that gives us, which is Alt F3. Okay, so it looks like the um, D menu thing that you'll probably be used to if you've used I3 before. Again, you can type the name of a package up here. Hit Enter, and then that will open up the package for you. Pretty handy to have that there as well. So we have Super, which will just open up the main menu. OK, so that basically just simulates a right click wherever the mouse cursor is. So that's a right click. And then that's the same thing with the super key. And it'll be wherever the mouse is. And also you can open up the menu here as well with a little flame Bunsen logo. OK, what's next? We have super and tab. So is that a client menu? So that's going to switch between windows. So let's open a couple of things up. 
Let's open up Funar and we'll use the Alt F2 one again. And then let's also open up a terminal. Do we have a terminal shortcut anywhere? Yes, so the terminal shortcut is Super and T. So that'll open up the terminal for you, which has got a transparent window. And now let's see what the Super and Tab looks like. There you go, so you get quite a small Windows sort of tab there and it will open wherever your mouse is, it appears, which is pretty cool. And then you could, oh, and that's quite handy as well. So Openbox by default, at least the last time I used it, it didn't have the um, sort of window snapping side by side enabled out of the box. So they've probably set that in the auto, not the auto start, in the open box. I think it uses an RC for its config. We'll have a look. It's been a while since I've used Openbox properly. So that was the Super and Tab terminal we've checked out. Web browser, of course, is Firefox. We've already checked that one out. We have the Files Manager, which is Funa. Let's just make sure that shortcut key is working. So the editor, what is the editor? Okay, so the editor is a Genie. I've not used Genie too much, so I'm not too well versed in how this all works, to be fair. But for those wondering, it's a version 1.33. Let's keep moving. Media player. So I wonder what their default media player is, and that is Super and M. Nice. Okay, cool. So the default media player is VRC, which has no complaints from me. It's my favorite media player. Volume control is Super V. That's a strange... I guess V for volume, okay, it makes sense. Okay, that appears to be opening the um, GUI sort of thing for Pulse Audio, I do believe. We'll have a look at all of the applications as well to make sure that that is what I think it is. Uh, task Manager, so what is our Task Manager? Nice, so the default Task Manager is HTOP, and you have a nice little Super and H shortcut to jump straight into that. And as you can see, we're using one gig, and of course, we've got nothing in our swap file as a uh, swap partition at the moment. We will test out hibernation towards the end. So if we press Q, that should just jump straight out of it. Very nice. Um, lock screen. Let's see what the lock screen's like. So Super and L. Okay, so it's just blanked the screen out. I'm going to imagine it's going to load the lock screen in a minute. Any second now. Do we have a lock screen? Aha, there we go. So here's the lock screen, and of course we can just type back our password to jump straight back into it. Okay, and we have a logout. Let's see what the logout is like. I tell you what, let's press this button here and to show the sort of logout and shutdown buttons there. So you have your logout, lock screen, suspend, and power off, as well as reboot. And we also have the screenshot. Let's make sure that works. So print screen, there we go. Is that GNOME screenshot? That might just be GNOME screenshot. I could be wrong, though. It looks like it. Perhaps it's not. Let's save that anywhere. Okay, so that's all of the screen sort of keys that are on there. Do we have any keys for moving windows to different workspaces and switching workspaces? So we can drag a window to the edge of our screen to change it to a different workspace. And how can we switch workspaces? Let me just try a couple of things. Okay, cool. So Alt and F1 and F2 appears to be tied to the screen uh, workspace switching, so that's all well and good. Right, let's have a little look around then. So of course you have the Tint 2 panel at the bottom. You have your sort of logout and shutdown button there. You have a clock with your calendar to pop up. You have your current connection, which we are on Ethernet. You then have the power icon that looks like XFCE Power Manager. It is indeed, so we're going to just disable display management for the moment. And then we have a clipboard there, I do believe. Yep, so that appears to just be a nice little clipboard. Let's uh, press clock again. And then we also have our volume rocker there and slider to control volume. So I wonder if the shortcut keys for the actual volume control works. There we go. So that all works out of the box. You get a nice little red border. And then when you go over it, it turns to white. So when it's sort of focused, it's white. And then inactive, it's red. That's quite a nice little color scheme as well. Okay, so let's see what this thing actually comes installed with. So we have quick launches there for web browser, file manager, text editor, and media player, which of course was uh, Firefox, Funar, was it Genie? Yep, Genie. And then obviously the media player is VLC. Okay, so in our, in our accessories we have XF Burn, Funar, file manager, Nitrogen. So Nitrogen is where you're going to control your sort of wallpapers and set them to, there'll be like a, in the auto start somewhere there'll be like a nitrogen restore or something 
So we have quite a, well we have a couple of little defaults here, let's try it with this one. Okay, that's not too bad, and let's see one more, we have BL Networks. Okay, I quite like that as well, we might leave it on that for the rest of this video. Right, so I think that's all I really want to look at in accessories, let's just double check. Uh, so it has Compton as well for your screen compositor, you have Clip It, which I think is that little clipboard that we saw at the bottom right there. You've got LibreOffice. Vim. Okay, Vim's not opening up anything. Let's see if Vim's actually installed. It's not. So we're going to install Vim. In fact, I won't. Yeah, I will install Vim now. Because we do want to get a RAM reading at boot, but Vim won't really affect that too much, to be fair. Let's keep it moving. Also, your running applications will be in your tint panel here. And obviously, you can click it and then click it again to restore it and I think a right click will close that running window. Right, let's see what else we have got. So we're going to go into development now. We have Genie, BLCL, I Editor and Text Editor and then we have the Icon Browser. What's the uh, text editor? There we go again, it's just Genie. So they've got some different Windows title names in the actual applications menu here. For graphics we have Ristretto the Image Viewer which is a fairly decent little image viewer there quite light. Multimedia we have XF Burn, VLC Media Player, Pulse Volume Audio Control, so that is what we saw when we press Super and V on the keyboard shortcuts there. I don't need to keep clicking down there do I? I keep forgetting we're on open box. <laughs> okay. Um, so we also have BL Media Player. Okay so again that's just VLC. So we have a couple of duplicate entries there. I'm not sure that's quite necessary to be honest. Okay, internet, it comes installed with file, FileZilla out of the box, which is pretty handy for those that have sort of web spaces and use the um, FTP or SFTP sort of stuff. That's pretty good. Let's keep going. So obviously your default web browser is Firefox. You also have HexChat, MailReader. I don't know if there is a mail client. Okay, so if you installed a mail client, you could then sort of set it in the preferred applications. And that appears to be from XFCE, though I could be wrong. Let's keep going. Um, I think that's what I really want to look at there and of course you have transmission to manage your clients. You then have LibreOffice. You don't appear to have the full suite. You have LibreOffice Calc and LibreOffice Writer. However, I only really use LibreOffice Writer these days. So let's see what version we have got on here. It will be quite an old version because of course we're using Debian. Yeah, so it's version 6.1.52. I think the current versions are on like the 6.4 version number and I think there's like a 7.0 release candidate floating around at the moment I could be wrong though okay in settings we have the panel manager which will just be your tint 2 panel themes where you can change the look and feel of your tint 2 panel quite a few sort of pre-configured ones there but we're going to leave it as the default let's keep moving you also have synaptic package manager so let's see how much packages are actually installed on this open box install close so we have 1217 1, packages installed i think the only additional thing we have installed so far is vim so let's keep going we have the power manager which is o the um, one from xfce a and r is what we use to set the screen layout to get that nice little mirror that we are currently using and we also have Openbox Configuration Manager, so here's where you can set like the Openbox theme, appearance, window size, etc. And what else have we got in settings? Customised look and feel, so what is the customised look and feel on here? It's either going to be the XFCE appearance or LX appearance. I think that's LX appearance, but let me just double check. Oh, wrong one, that was opening up the volume. Um, LX appearance. It is indeed. So it's using LX Appearance to change the Windows theming as well. So it's got quite a few. The default one is BL Lithium. You also have the light theme there. Let's leave it on the default though. And you have a few more like Yeti, Rayleigh, Rainforest. What's Rainforest? Oh, very green. I don't actually mind that though. It's like a washed out green. And then in the icon theming, as it said in the release notes, it's now using the Papyrus with the coloured stuff there. And it also has Gnome, ePapyrus and Add Water. What else have we got? So that's mainly what we want to look at in settings, I do believe. Alternatives configurator, so you can configure your alternatives in here as well. And you've got a list of quite a few packages there. Okay, so I think that's the whole 
the settings part done so in system of course you have your tint 2 panel which we have got at the bottom your terminal is the lx terminal has g parted out of the box it also has gw the package installer so you can install your dot dev packages with this little GUI here fairly fairly easily i don't know why that's now displayed a battery low icon we don't actually have a battery we're on a desktop so that's rather strange and it appeared at least when i noticed it was when we opened up gw kind of strange okay let's keep moving so i think that's mainly all we want to look at for the packages so i haven't used openbox properly in a while so what we're going to do is have a look at the configuration file again i think it's like an rc xml so we're going to go into our home folder and of course the files manager is super and f f for file so we're going to show our hidden files here and is it in config or open box or something okay i'm going to guess it's in config we appear to have single click so you might want to change that if you're anything like me so have your conky folder here as well do and then hovering over we'll just select that window that folder for you okay open box so we have the auto start we have the bl menu.xml if you want to edit the menu and then we have the xml so i think this is where all of the sort of key bindings etc is set yeah so if you wanted to change any of the key bindings and stuff like that you could do it in this file here okay looking very good so far right what we're going to do is test out the hibernation now so we're going to open up a couple of programs let's open up firefox web browser of course i could have just clicked web browser and it would have been right there and we're going to go to our terminal now and type in system ctl hibernate i keep pressing super and v i don't know why i'm doing that does Alt F4 shut our window? It does indeed. Okay, so we're going to go System CTL Hibernate. Right, it will take a little second and you won't actually notice anything on the screen that you're looking at. It will just freeze that image. Okay, so it appears to be winding down now. My computer seems to be taking quite a lot, a long amount of time to actually sort of activate hibernation at the moment. I noticed it the other day when we done the Gecko Linux run through as well. So my fans are still spinning, so hopefully they'll sort of wind down and then we'll be able to just mash enter to get the computer back on. And then all of those programs that you can currently see on the window there will, should still be there after a reboot. Okay, so the computer's finally turned off. So what we're going to do now is mash enter and hopefully it will boot up. It will. We'll have to go through the, log, um, the boot screen for the grub, but we, we can use that sort of opportunity to have a look at how they've set up the grub screen and see if it's picked up all of the operating systems that are currently installed on this computer and then hopefully the hibernation has worked and all of those programs that we had running will still be there and there is the bunsen labs grub screen it hasn't picked up everything by the looks of it but most of it is there also we didn't apply and save the screen layout but because we're resuming from hibernate if it's all worked correctly the screen mirror should still be active Okay, we are back in business. Let me just type in the password there. Perfect. So the hibernation does work. It just seems to take quite a while these days. Right, what we're going to do now is do a reboot, check out the RAM and see how much this uses at boot. And then we're also going to install XFCE and just see how that sets it up. I'm going to imagine it's just the default setup, but I want to see how easy it is to switch in between the two. So we're now just going to reboot and we'll be back in just a moment. Okay, so we're back in business. We're using between sort of 500 and 600 megabytes, which isn't too bad. It's a little bit higher than I thought it might have been, but it's nothing too crazy. We did forget to um, actually set the screen mirror. So what we're going to do is just quickly jump into the AR and R settings and then just quickly set up a screen mirror. And then what we're going to do is install XFCE and just very quickly jump into that using the login screen to see how easy it switches over because like it says in the release notes they do coexist quite peacefully together and then we're going to wrap it up there the screen should be mirrored in just a second boom there we go always does that when we um, do a mirror it chucks that window all the way over there okay let's install xfce uh, what is the terminal super t Right, that will install XFC for us. I don't think it's going to have a whole load of packages to actually grab though, because we've got quite a few of the sort of XFC stuff like Power Manager and a few of the settings there. So what have we got? Yeah, it's not. It's only actually going to use an additional 43.5 megabytes of disk space, so that's really not a lot at all. 
So we're almost going to finish that completely. So that was a very quick install of XFCE. We'll also see how much RAM XFCE uses and we'll compare that to the actual default open box. So now what we're going to do is log out using this one here. Okay, so I'm going to try and show you it on this screen. So if we press this little Bunsen there, we should have the XFCE session right there. And then we could log in now and we'll be greeted with like the default XFCE stuff. And it will ask us for like panel and stuff like that. So you can't see that at the moment, but there we go. It's asking, we're going to go for the default. And then what I'm going to quickly do is set up a screen mirror on here. I'm going to imagine we have the XFCE display settings now. So if we go into display, we are going to mirror displays, click apply, and then you should be with us in just a second. There we go. So it shouldn't have installed too much additional stuff really, because they use quite a lot of the same packages. Obviously certain stuff like, you know, XFC settings that aren't present there will be installed. But other than that, it doesn't appear to have blowed it out too much. What I'm gonna do is do a reboot, get a RAM reading on XFCE as well. And then we're gonna wrap it up there. But so far, so good. I'm actually quite enjoying this latest release of Bunsen Labs. Okay, we're back in business. Yeah, XFCE is pretty much the same. So that's now using 512-ish megabytes. So I guess that's gonna be the happy medium that you're always gonna get between 500 and 600 megabytes, regardless of whether you're using the open box default or if you've also installed XFCE as well. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe. Also join a Discord, there's a link in the description. See you on the next one, bye-bye.